Today's presentation is uh, a brief overview of the history of automotive uh, heating and air conditioning systems. Um, it's originally, while I worked at Ford, I uh, prepared this booklet uh, called Automotive Climate Control, The First 100 Years. And this uh, little 100-page booklet was produced to train new engineers that came into the organization of climate control. Um, and uh, it was a very popular book within Ford Motor Company. Uh, we distributed a lot of copies to uh, the new engineers, and uh, uh, even after it was out of print, we had requests for it, and we had a second printing. So uh, a lot of people encouraged me to extend it uh, or expand it into a, a full-size book, which which I've done, uh, and this is the the full-size book. Automotive Climate Control, 116 Years of Progress. This is a patent issued May 1st, 1928 for a hot water heater with a fan. This is a forerunner of modern automotive heating uh, systems. Still in use today, this is the genesis of, of those heaters in that it's hot water, and an electric fan to distribute the hot air into the passenger compartment. And uh, except for the uh, electrical vehicles, this, this technology is, is the basic technology still in use today. This is a, an example of an ad from that era. Again, these heaters were offered by the aftermarket, so they were sold um, through automotive magazines and through uh, dealers and uh, repair shops. This is a, an interesting uh, alternative for heating. Uh, the others that employed the exhaust system or the engine cooling system uh, were alternatives. This is the third one. This was a, a system that used a collector to collect the heat coming off the vehicle's radiator and the, and the fan, the vehicle engine cooling fan, forced the air through this duct or pipe into the passenger compartment. And it, there was a little uh, push-pull rod here that closed a door to, uh, uh, to shut off the heater when it was not wanted. And this was an interesting alternative to the, uh, to the exhaust heaters that we've looked at. And again, this, this company was offering shutters to, for the radiator. This uh, um, heater ad always fascinated me for a couple of reasons. Uh, it's, it's a, this is kind of a hybrid heater when we look at the exhaust system. In that this, this too has a scoop here at the, behind the fan of the radiator. It forces the air through the um, uh, sleeve around the muffler and forces the hotted air into the passenger compartment. This is one alternative, $7.50. This is the one that really caught my eye though. The manufacturer called it Torrid Heat. This heat exchanger was actually in the vehicle's passenger compartment. And these inlet and outlet ducts ran the exhaust, the vehicle exhausts through this heat exchanger, which was located in the passenger compartment. And, and uh, let me just read the fine print here. It says, Torrid heat requires no shutters or thermostat to ensure efficient results cannot leak nor allow motor fumes to enter the car because of special construction and installation. So if you believe that, <laughs> this, this had to be the most dangerous situation uh, one can imagine. Uh, an automobile engineer today would, this would, uh, would not even cross their mind. This is uh, uh, an ad for 1929 Cadillac uh, accessories. There are two items here that I wanted to point out. This was, was called a breeze filter windshield screen for this VV windshield, this, this uh, vertical ventilation windshield. This was a screen that would, would be fitted to prevent insects and large chunks of things from entering the passenger compartment. Uh, again, aftermarket accessory item. This is the one that that that, that always uh, has intrigued me since I uh, began writing the book. This is a little electric fan that was uh, attached to the header of the vehicle, and it was used to 
uh, in winter time to move air across the windshield to minimize fogging, and in the summertime to increase ventilation. The interesting thing about these fans is they are still in use today, still in production. There are several manufacturers making these small electric fans for automotive applications. And you would think with modern climate control systems that you wouldn't need them, but, but uh, they are still in production. The other interesting thing about these little fans is all the United States mail trucks, the little small trucks, were not fitted with air conditioners, but they were 100% fitted with, with small electric fans. Hmm. So it's, it's kind, of, kind of interesting. This uh, is an interesting windshield wiper system. These were two, horns, two vertical blades that ran side to side across the front of the windshield. Um, and again, th th these, were control these were powered by uh, uh, the vacuum system from the engine. We talked about lap robes previously. Lap robes continue to be popular in, in vehicles until the late 40s. The last one I could find was the 1949 Mercury offered lap robes monogrammed with the owner's initials for the vehicle. So they were, they were very popular for many, many years, considered a luxury item. The, the lap robes uh, used fabric from, from the vehicle upholstery. Cool cushions. These are interesting devices too. These were used uh, for the driver typically in the summertime that, uh, that allowed air to move between the driver and or passenger and the, and the, uh, and the seat of the vehicle. And uh, they were made of, uh, they were, uh, it says about half inch thick, coil springs about half inch thick, covered by a strong, loosely woven uh, fiber bound with durable uh, Fabrilock and uh, came in various colors. And these have, were popular clearly into the 1960s and they're still available today. You can still buy cool cushions from J.C. Whitney today. <laughs> Tire chains, again, these were offered by Cadillac. They were genuine accessories. Believe it or not, for those who know what a tire chain is, some automobile manufacturers today still offer their own branded tire chains as genuine accessories. Two or three luxury vehicle makers offer uh, tire chains today. Of course, we don't use them uh, very much anymore because of winter tires, front wheel drive vehicles. Uh, we, we just don't need tire chains very much, but, uh, but they are still available from some OEMs as uh, genuine accessories. Defrosters were not uh, common uh, up until the late 20s, early 30s. This is a, an early example of a, of a defroster system that was a, attached to a, either a, a hot a water heater or a, perhaps a fuel fire, uh, a, a, an exhaust heater. But anyway, the ducts, as you can see, were just uh, flexible tubes. Defroster nozzles were attached to the, to the windshield using vacuum uh, cups. Very crude by today's standards, of course, but uh, this, is, this is how they began. This is another alternative for uh, windshield defrosting uh, or de-icing. These were devices that consisted of a piece of glass that, uh, was, sur that was surrounded by uh, heating elements, and they, again, were attached to the windshield right in front of the driver's uh, vision zone uh, with uh, suction cups. And you can see the wire uh, runs down to the, to the vehicle uh, electric system. Thermostats, any cooling thermostats were not common uh, practice, uh, certainly not in 1920 or 1930 when this, uh, for the Chevrolet. They offered a genuine Chevrolet thermostat for $2 installed. And they also offered a genuine Chevrolet heater for $9.85 installed. And again, this was, a, was an exhaust uh, type uh, heater with a, with a duct coming off the fan, the vehicle fan. This was uh, the beginning of an uh, era that focused on ventilation. 1933, Fisher Body offered something called no draft ventilation. I always got a kick out of this ad. 
the, the wife is saying, close the window, Harry. I'm simply freezing. And Harry says, close the window. Why well, I'm already roasting now. So uh, <laughs> this, this problem of uh, his and her uh, uh, heating, uh, her ventilation was, was common back then. This new system circulates air in the car, removes smoke, is individually controlled. It eliminates drafts, prevents cl uh, clouding, and uh, cools the car in hot weather. So what was this? They were little movable windows uh, on the side doors that could be opened at various angles to accomplish all of these tasks. These little movable uh, quarter windows uh, would eventually be called venta panes. And they began in 1933 on General Motors vehicles, and they quickly spread to all, essentially all vehicles made in uh, North America. This is Packard's uh, version, again 1933. The Packard was interesting in that they had a little quarter window at the front of the of the side window, but they also had a movable, uh, vertically hinged uh, glass at the rear of that window. So both of these pieces of glass could be manipulated to achieve all kinds of uh, ventilation alternatives. And this is a photograph of a 1933 Packard. You can see here this, this bar the, and the two pieces of glass. This is a um, Caltop air intake, which we'll, we'll talk about more in just a moment. And this uh, beautiful young lady in the back seat happens to be a mannequin. The 1934 Ford, as well as other manufacturers, offered uh, crank out uh, windshields. These were very common, uh, again, as a ventilation aid. Um, this, this piece of glass was hinged at the top and uh, was uh, a crank located on the top of the instrument panel to be rotated to move the glass out or, of course, close it. This is an interesting car in that uh, this is a 1933 Ford from the Ed Muir collection. Ed Muir is a uh, pretty um, a uh, well-known automotive collector here in Metro Detroit. He has a collection of several hundred cars, and this, this particular vehicle is a 1933 Ford. It's fitted with both the Ford Motor Company authorized uh, heater. This was an exhaust heater, and it was also fitted with an aftermarket uh, hot water heater. So I, I, I don't know why uh, the second heater was fitted to the car, but I would guess that the heat exchanger failed on this, this original equipment uh, heater, and they installed this heater. Uh, again, once you've got uh, anything to do with the exhaust system of the vehicle, it's extremely dangerous. And I, I would guess that's what's happened here, but I thought it was kind of an interesting uh, situation. This was also interesting. Uh, I showed you a photo of that, uh, that Packard with the forward-facing Caltop uh, ventilation air inlet. Uh, these, these were very popular. It uh, uh, allowed the air to come into the passenger compartment through the Caltop, a high-pressure area. But this 34 Buick uh, said the, uh, they thought they had a better idea here. Uh, air pressure close to the windshield is greater, so more air comes in when the ventilator opening is reversed. A deflector beneath the cowl prevents a blast. Well, this is this is very unorthodox to have a rear-facing uh, cowl top air inlet, and uh, so I looked into it, and they used it in 34 and 35, 1936. They reverted to the the traditional uh, front uh, air inlet. This is an example of uh, again this quest for perfect ventilation. The Chrysler Airflows feature two cowl top vent inlets and two windshields uh, that could be cranked out or both the both sides of the windshield could be cranked out and again it was to maximize the amount of, uh, of ventilation air that entered the passenger compartment the 35 ford coupe and also studebaker coupe in that era uh, the offered uh, in their coupe versions rear windows that uh, roll down or in the Packard's, I mean, the Studebaker's case, uh, it opened, it was hinged at the top. But again, to prove, improve ventilation in the vehicle. This was an interesting uh, development as, as defrosters evolved. 
This is a 1936 Hudson Terraplane, and the defroster nozzles were actually hidden under the instrument panel, and the driver had to open these a, a little door in order to have the defroster nozzle pop up through this opening. The 1938 uh, Nash featured what they called the weather eye system. This was a milestone in automotive heating systems in that prior to this, all the heaters had been uh, offered as aftermarket items, and, and I showed you the alternatives, and they were all fitted uh, to the dash panel of the vehicle. This Nash, 38 Nash, was the first vehicle to actually design the car around the heating system. It, uh, the vehicle was designed from the beginning to be fitted with a very sophisticated heating and ventilation system. So this was, this was a milestone vehicle uh, for uh, modern heating systems, fully integrated. This was uh, what was called the Stuart Warner, Stuart Warner Southwind heater. This was a fuel-fired heater that was uh, fitted to the passenger compartment. This is an interesting heater and it actually used gasoline from the, the vehicle fuel system. A little pipe ran into the heater. It had its own ignition system and a, a, and a blower. And uh, even though it sounds dangerous, it was not near as dangerous as the exhaust uh, systems. And millions of these Southwind heaters were sold throughout the years. They were very, very popular uh, in automobiles. Very fast uh, warm-up, uh, much faster than, than, uh, than hot water, and uh, they were very popular. This is another image, uh, set of images for this uh, Stuart Warner Southwind heater. This is what it looked like installed in the vehicle and here. And again, this was a uh, uh, defroster system uh, as, a alter as a, another accessory that goes along with, uh, with the uh, Southwind heater itself. Again, very popular. They sold millions of these things. 1935 Fisher body uh, was one of the earliest applications of windshield wipers fitted to the cowl rather than the windshield headers. Prior to this, uh, in fact, I think the 1934 Studebaker was the first one with the cowl uh, uh, mounted wipers. But prior to this, all the vehicles had the, the windshield wipers mounted above the windshield. 1936 uh, was the first year for windshield washers, as we know them today. 